Praise God. Man, isn't God good? Amen. So thankful for the name of Jesus. Thankful that we serve a God that answers prayer. And uh, I'm just glad that when we come to church, we don't have to come and it just be uh, a formality, but there's actual answers and power and prayer here. And uh, I just sent every time I pray for you and I pray for our church, I'm, I just I have such an expectancy that when we come together and gather like this, that that God can change things in your life. It's not always instant. I mean, we'd love it if it was. Sometimes it is. It's not always instant, but by yielding your life to the Word of God and to Jesus Christ, you're going to experience change. And uh, that's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the Word of God. Amen. Praise God. Well, we are beginning a new series this morning on Christmas. And uh, I want to answer a question this morning of why did Jesus come in the first place? Why did why is the birth of Christ even significant? You know, so many people celebrate Christmas. As a matter of fact, I read a, a statistic this week that in America, 95% of people still celebrate Christmas. It's a very small majority, a very small minority of people that don't celebrate Christmas. Now, that doesn't mean all of them celebrate it uh, for the same reason that you do, but people participate in the holiday of Christmas. 95% of Americans still do. 51% of that 95 say that Christmas is a strongly religious holiday for them. 31% say that it is a somewhat religious holiday for them. So that's still uh, 82% of people in America say that Christmas is a religious holiday for them. But I think if you ask the average person to really go a little bit past kind of the facts of Christmas, I think people know a lot of the facts. They know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They know that Jesus was born in a manger. They know there was an angel that appeared to some shepherds. They know there were some wise men. They know that uh, it was a virgin birth. And they know a few things about the facts of Christmas, but the facts of Christmas is not really what we're celebrating. We're not really celebrating those, those facts. We're celebrating something deeper than that. And if you ask people and you said, okay, yes, we know all the facts, but why do you think God had to actually come in human form, and what, what difference does it make whether he did or not? And if you ask the average person, do you think God could have redeemed humanity in some other process? Some other way. Do you, why, why did he have to become a man and be born the way that he was? Why was that significant? Well, what you find out from reading the Bible is that, no, it actually couldn't have been done any other way. But most people don't maybe know that or understand that. And so I want to answer that question this morning. If we're going to celebrate Christmas, let's answer that question. Why did Jesus have to be born in the first place? Why did he have to be born as a man? Why is it significant that God became a human being and and could it have been done any other any other way when you read the gospels that what you actually get is you get those facts that i was talking about earlier the gospel gives the gospels the matthew mark luke and john the eyewitness accounts of what happened uh, when jesus came they give us the facts of the gospel like i mentioned before they give us the facts. They tell the story of what happened. They give us the details. But then Paul, the apostle, comes along with his letters. And what Paul does is he gives us more than the facts. He gives us the significance of those facts. The gospel doesn't really do that. I mean, the gospel gives it to us straightforward. But if all you had was the gospels, I don't think we would quite understand. Like, there's a lot of things we wouldn't understand without Paul's letters. If we only had the gospels. We'd know the facts of it. We would know Jesus died, he came, he was 33. We would know a lot of facts. But without Paul's letters, for example, we wouldn't know that actually we were crucified with Christ. We were buried and, and, and resurrected three days later. See, that, that revelation came from the... You would never know that from, from reading just the Gospels. You only find that out from reading Paul. So the Gospels are like... 
an eyewitness telling you what happened on the surface. The, the Gospels are like a doctor looking at your physical symptoms on the outside and going, oh yeah, I see that cut or that wound or I see you limping, but I won't really know what's going on behind that until we take an x-ray or an MRI to see what's really going on underneath the surface. The Gospels are that kind of outside view and then Paul's letters that they are the MRI that go behind the scenes and they go, yeah, this is what you were seeing in the natural. The man, the beard, the crown of thorns, all you were seeing the, the facts of it. But Paul says, let me explain to you what was happening behind the scenes in the supernatural, in the spiritual realm. And what was happening in the spiritual realm is a thousand times more important than what was happening from the facts of it on the surface. Is that making sense? And a lot of people, that's all they celebrate. They're celebrating what happened in the natural. They're celebrating a man, and, a lot, and you go into a lot of people's homes. You know, sometimes what do you see? You see a man on a cross, crucified. They're, they're celebrating the, the fact of that. But listen, there was something way more significant happening than what you could see with your natural eye. And I want to talk to you about that this morning. The gospel show us what could be seen in the natural, but Paul revealed to us what was happening in the unseen realm in the spirit. Now, all of Paul's letters, they're just that. They're letters. They're not written in a cohesive way. They're, they're written to different groups of people in different cities to address specific questions. And so you don't get just one cohesive point by point explanation of the gospel you got to read all the letters and kind of put it all together and I'm going to try to sort of do that for you over the next few weeks but the most cohesive and the clearest explanation of the gospel that we get from Paul is in the book of Romans one of the things I want you to realize about Paul too is that Paul didn't get his revelation the same way that Peter John Mark and Luke got theirs uh, Peter and John and Mark and those guys, uh, they, they, they were apostles, they were disciples, and, and some of them walked directly with Christ. And they heard his teaching. They lived with him for three years. But Paul got his revelation in a different way. Paul got his revelation straight from Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. In other words, the Jesus that was on the other side, the Jesus that didn't walk the earth, but he'd been resurrected. He appeared to Paul in a vision. And he explained what was happening at the death, burial, and resurrection to him. We get this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, excuse me, actually Galatians 1, 11. We're going to look at first. Galatians 1, 11. Paul said, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. In other words, I did not get this from another human being. Nothing wrong with that. Right? That's how Timothy got it. That's how Luke got it. That's how Mark got it. They got it from men like Peter and John that walked directly with Jesus and it was passed down to them. That's fine. But Paul is saying that's not how it came to me. He's saying I'm not parroting something, which would be okay, but I'm not parroting something that someone else told me. I got this straight from Jesus. This is what we believe. Right? This is the word of God. So I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So God chose Paul to explain to us what was really happening on the cross and what was really happening at the death, burial, and resurrection. And he has a, he has a first-hand, straight-from-Jesus revelation, and I'm going to begin to explain to you from years of studying Paul's letters and, and sort of putting it together in a cohesive way, what was that revelation? What did, what did Jesus try to explain to Paul? Because if we can answer that, then we're going to understand the significance of Christmas. We're going to understand why is it that God had to become man and be born as a baby? Why, why couldn't he have just showed up as a 30-year-old man? Just out of nowhere, just walk out of the woods somewhere, you know, and hey, there's Jesus. Why did he have to come and be physically born of another human being, yet he had no father? All of it, there's not a single piece of it that uh, is disposable. There's not a single piece of it that's not required 
for the gospel to make sense. Every piece of it has to be there. It has to be correct for this to have worked and be, and be effective as it was. The number one revelation, number one piece of Paul's revelation that he gives us, he begins by explaining that you and I are children of Adam. Now, this is significant to the whole thing. So we're going to go through this over the next few weeks. But the first thing you've got to know about the gospel, it begins by understanding who Adam and Eve were and that you are children of Adam. Jesus was not a child of Adam. You'll see that in a, in a minute. But we are children of Adam. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you inherited certain things. Just like you inherited certain things from your natural parents. Some of you have blue eyes. Some of you have brown eyes. Some of you have blonde hair. Some of you have light skin. All of that was determined by who your parents were, and you had zero choice in the matter. And as some of you say, well, if I had a choice, yeah, if I had a choice, it would, things would have been a little bit different. But we didn't have a choice in it, right? We didn't have a choice what family we were born into. And there were certain things passed down to us that we had absolutely no choice in. We inherited them. Paul gives the revelation, more important than what color your hair is or your eyes or your skin or any of that, Paul gives the revelation that you inherited something from your father Adam called a sin nature. And because of that sin nature, you are guilty and condemned to eternal separation from God. Now, that might not make sense to you when you first hear it because you go, well, that's unfair. Well, yeah, it's unfair that you were born into the family that you were in, maybe. You know, I'm, I, how many of you feel blessed that you were born in America? There's a lot of other places we could have been born. But we had no choice in that. There are billions of people that were born elsewhere under different conditions. They had no choice in that. It's almost as if you just woke up one day and you were on a burning airplane, is is on fire and in flames, and it's going down, and there's people yelling, and sirens going off, and oxygen bags dropping down, and and, and you just kind of woke up, and you're like, uh, what what is going on here, and why is this plane going down, and I, I didn't want to be here, I didn't choose to be here, yeah, that that's kind of how we, on this planet, we woke up one day, it's not happening in that level of like urgency, but we woke up on something that is headed towards complete and total destruction. You woke up, when you were born, you woke up to a planet that's cursed, that's filled with sin and death, disease, violence, abuse, horrific sin of every kind. You didn't choose it. You were just born here, and all of it is because of what happened with Adam. And what Paul explains is that every one of us are children of Adam, and through uh, that, that connection to him, we actually inherited sin, we inherited death. Listen, the reason why you're going to die, a physical death, is because of Adam and because of your connection to Adam. Romans chapter 5, 12 explains this. Paul, again, sharing that revelation that Jesus gave, he said, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, stop. How did sin come into the world? Through one man, Adam. We're going to go back and look at that story in a moment. Sin came into the world through one man. Now, let me just tell you, when you hear the word sin, it, it, it conjures up all kinds of different uh, thoughts and feelings and opinions for people. But sin is, is the worst thing that ever happened to this planet. Okay, sin is not like, oh, I sinned, oh, forgive me, I sinned. It's like, it's this cute little thing, oh, I sinned, I forgive, please forgive me, Lord, you know, I'm going to repent for that later. Sin is the cause of every single problem on this planet. That's it. That's it. Every horrific thing, every war, every abuse, every death, every awful thing that has ever happened on planet Earth is the result of this first sentence that we just read right here, just as sin came into the world through one man, we blame Adam. Now when you get there, you know, you could have a conversation with him and point the finger if you want to. Maybe some would blame Eve, I don't know, go back and read the story. It's, but Paul says it's Adam, so 
one man. Here's what's, here's what's happening. God, we're going to go back and read in a minute, but God put, put man in, in his perfect creation. And guess what? There was no sin here. If you're hurting this morning, if you're in pain, physical pain, it's because of sin. If your heart is hurting because something is broken emotionally or a relationship, it's because of sin. Sin destroys. This, see, people think, they read the Bible and they have this, this faulty mentality. They think, man, God is like such a prude. He doesn't want us to have any fun. It's against everything. You know, it's against uh, partying. It's against drinking. It's against sex. It's against gambling. It's against everything, which half of those things may not even be in there, but that's another sermon. But it's against, it's against, it's against. Listen, let me tell you, it's not about what God is against. It's about what he is for. He is for you living a healthy life and being blessed and having God's best. And so he's against these other things because he loves you. And we're like, oh, God's against all of those things. You know, that's like getting mad at your doctor because he's telling you to quit smoking, you know. It's like, it's not that I hate cigarettes, okay. I, I'm for you. I want you to be healthy. I want you to live a long life. I've seen people in your position after 40 years of smoking and what their lungs look like. You smoke if you want to, Okay. I think some of you do smoke in here. I'm not against that, okay? I think, we had to, I think we had to put some ashtrays out front anyway. It's a good time to mention, don't throw your cigarettes in the trash can on the inside. By the way, we've got cigarette butts outside in the front ashtray. Let's put them there. I don't want you catching the whole building on fire, okay? So thank you for that. Side note. Now, uh, so your doctor doesn't care if you smoke because he, oh, I'm just, you know, he, he just a prude and he hates it. No, he loves you and he wants you to, to be healthy. The Bible is the same way. You've got to understand what sin is. Sin destroys, it kills. Sin is the breaking of divine law. And God's laws were all set up so that we could live in perfect harmony and perfect peace with God and each other. And by violating that, we've messed everything up. Listen, every single thing you see wrong with this planet is a result of humans doing things their way instead of God's way. Every single thing that we see, every problem that we see. So Paul explains, just as sin came into the world through one man, and then death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And this is the part we don't like. We go, well, well Adam, Adam messed up, not me. Adam sinned, not me. But what the, the revelation that we're getting here is that that sin was so significant that when he opened the door to that sin, it was like a disease that spread to all of humanity. That's how significant it was. Why? Because Adam was the head. Adam was given full and complete authority. He opened the door to something that should have never been let in. And this answers a lot of questions that the world has about why things are the way they are. Adam was the spiritual authority and head of our entire race. And when he sinned and he opened that door, it let in something that could not be put back in the bottle. And, and we could preach another sermon about how you are the, the head. Some of you are the head and the leader and the authority of your home. And, and this principle is still applying. There are things going on in your family and in your life that because you're the authority, you're letting in. But that's another sermon. Verse 17 he said, for if because, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Of course, he's talking about the second Adam, Jesus. So, the first Adam is the Adam described in the book of Genesis, but what the scripture also teaches us, another revelation that Paul had, is that Jesus is the second Adam. We're going to get more into that next week. But basically, his explanation is this. One man let in sin for all the world, another man let in righteousness and justification for the whole world to redeem us from that sin. Okay? 
So we have to go back to the beginning to completely understand this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God has been, this is uh, the very first chapter of the Bible. It's explaining how we got here, explaining the world, the creation, the, the plants and animals and all of the creation, how it got here. Then in verse 26, we get to where God's going to make man. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we get a lot of revelation from these scriptures. When I read this, I, I really just, I want to pay so much attention to every single word because the truth of it, it, it lies in how it is said. Notice he says, let us. Okay, that's the first thing. God doesn't say, let me. He says, let us. And what you find out from the rest of the Bible is about something called the Trinity, which is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in the beginning, he, it's, the, it's the three in one, we call it, but they're there, and he, he says to Jesus, he says to the Holy Spirit, let us make man. This is the first time we get this word in the Bible. The word actually is not man, the word is Adam. Word for man is, in the Hebrew, the, the word is Adam, that he was named after what he was. So he said, let us make man in our image. Now, up to this point, everything else has been made different than the image of God. There's nothing else been created yet that's like God. That's all that means. Don't get caught up on these words, you know, oh, let us make in the image. What he's saying is, we're going to make something that's like us. We're now about to create something that is, that is like us. It's made after us. It's, it's in our likeness. It's very close to us. Now, how close exactly are we to God? I would say that in our fallen sin nature, we're a lot further away than Adam was. But I would say the first man, Adam, was a lot like God. I mean, if we, if, if we read through the Bible and we find out, uh, you know, all the things that we learn about God, God has eyes, He can see, God has ears, He can hear. God has hands, feet. Certain places in Scripture talk about God having a beard. I'm just saying, that's, if you want to truly be God-like, you need to work on that. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Are you getting this? I know we take this for granted. Do you, do you ever just look at yourself in the mirror? I mean, do you ever just look at your hands and how they work and your eyes and think, we take this for granted. We were made like God. It's amazing to me. I know these, I seem weird talking about it this morning, but I, I'm sometimes amazed. I'm like, I can, I can think to move this finger and it moves. I can't do that with anything else. I wish I could. I wish I could control a few other things, but I, I can look at the finger and just think it and it moves. From some electrical signal, I don't understand how it works, but we were created in the image of God to think and reason. You're not a rock that, that just sits there all day. It doesn't even know it exists. You are like God. You were created after the image of God. Very similar to how God thinks. Listen, there are people in the Bible that had conversations with God. You're not out there having a conversation with a sunflower. Right? Because it ain't on the same level as you. So for us to be able to pray, talk to God, have a conversation with God, we're, we're somehow on a similar, we're not God's, but we're on a similar level, similar plane as God. We know His thoughts and, and all that are higher than ours, all of that. I'm just, I'm just getting you to understand. The Bible even calls us sons of God. We're not the son of God like Jesus, but we are, we've been adopted into his family. So it's, it's not like we're, we're like, you know, it's not the difference between you and a plant or even you and your dog. There, there's a different relationship here. And God made this decision. Do you understand the risk involved in making this decision? The risk involved in making a being that was like him, that could make choices like him, that had a free will like him, that had freedom like him to do or not do. He created a being that could turn around and look at him and say, I hate you and I will never follow you and I'm going to forget everything you said and I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. 
That's the, the power that he gave us. He didn't have to do that. But here's the thing. See, we, we value our freedom, but we don't, we don't value the consequences of what come along with it. See, because you either have high freedom or high control. So it's one or the other. You can't have complete control, but also give somebody complete freedom. If you give somebody complete freedom, what you give up at the same time is control. And what God did in the garden was he gave man complete freedom. He gave us the rules. He said, don't do this, but you're completely free to do it if you want to, because I'm not creating a race of robots that don't have choice to love me or not love me, that don't have a choice to follow me or not follow me, to, to only do what I tell them to do. He created a being like him that could choose and had freedom to, to do or not do, to create, to bless. And he put us in this perfect environment with all of these things, and we had the choice to do or not do. That is the complete freedom that God gave us. Now, with complete freedom comes extremely high consequences. Some of you have teenagers and you've turned the keys over to them and you said, okay, for the first time you turned them loose on the road. <laughs> I've talked to some of you. Okay, we're, we're a few months away from that, so watch out. Wear your seatbelt when you, when you got out. But, you know, when they have their permit, there's still some control, right? You, you're, you're given the, the, the will, but you're in the next seat next to them, and you still you have some control there. There comes the moment where you hand them the keys, and you go, okay, and they go out on the highway. What is that? They now have complete freedom. But what comes along with that is very steep and very high consequences. They could kill themselves. They could kill someone else. It's that significant. But that's the cost of complete freedom. And what God gave us in the garden was complete freedom. But then, with complete freedom, we own the consequences. That's right. if you, and, and everybody wants freedom, but they don't want the consequences. Everybody wants to live free. But then they don't want the results when they ruin their life through their own choices. Everybody wants complete freedom without any interference. But then they want a safety net when, when they make bad decisions and everything goes wrong. They want somebody to bail them out. They want somebody to provide uh, food and shelter and, and health care and all of these things. But the problem with that is when you have complete freedom, you're responsible for the outcomes, good or bad. That's it. You don't get both. You either get freedom or you get control. You, either, either one. But you can't have both. And what God decided was to create a world where man created in his image with the correct faculties and, and mind and intelligence and everything he needed to make good choices. He turned the keys over and he said, the whole planet is yours. I've made you like me. Now rule, reign, you have dominion over it. And, and God was there. The Bible says that they walked in the cool of the garden together. They could talk. They could fellowship. They could ask God questions. If they didn't know something, they could ask. They were given complete freedom. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. That was our first calling. Dominion, control, leadership, authority over this planet. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. So man and woman ruling together, reigning, exercising dominion over this planet. So the question is, if God gave authority to Adam, then who has authority now? Because if God put Adam in a perfect world with created in his image and gave him everything he needed to run it, what happened? Well, you know the story. We're not going to read the whole story this morning. But Adam and Eve sinned. They rejected God's instruction, they rebelled against God, and they let Satan in, they let sin in, they let death in. 
Now, you've got to remember that this relationship between Satan and God existed before Adam existed. Uh, from what we know from Scripture, Satan was cast out of heaven long before this whole situation happened. And so Satan um, was, was trying to ruin this thing from the very get-go. But the question is, how did, how did Adam lose his authority? Well, he lost, it through, he lost it through sin and through rebellion. But the question is, who has authority now? And from Scripture, we're gonna, it, it's kind of a twofold answer. But actually what happened is, is that Adam took his authority and that he gave it over to Satan. And I'm going to show you that from Scripture. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 is the first place we're going to look. This is another key piece of the story because people are confused on this and they look around the world and they go, well, if God is in control... It, what? Let me ask you this. When you look around the planet and you see things that are happening, does it look like God's running things or does it look like Satan is running things? <laughs> Let's just use some common sense. If you want to know what it looks like when God is in complete control, it's what heaven looks like. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't sovereign and God doesn't have control over what happens on this planet. There's, a, there's truth in both, and I'm going to show you that from Scripture. But let me just tell you, what is happening on this planet is not God's perfect will. And, and people have been so confused on this. I mean, they've acted like, well, everything that happens is God's will. Somebody gets cancer and dies. A child dies in a car accident. It's God's will somehow. Listen, that's not God's will. God's will is not for people to die, suffer. That's not God's will. God's will is being done in heaven. This is why Jesus taught everybody to pray. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. See what he said? We pray, we pray that prayer. But what he was praying was the will of God's being done in heaven. So let's pray that it's done here as it's being done there. Why? Because it ain't being done here. So we, we want it to be done here like it's being done in heaven, but it's not being done here. And if you want to know why, you've got to go all the way back to the garden. Luke chapter 4, verse 5, we're going to corroborate this with Scripture. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. This is when Jesus is being tempted, tempted in the wilderness. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to Jesus... To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Now, there's either one of two things happening here. Either one, Satan is lying, and this is not true, which is a very legitimate possibility that he does that. <laughs> or, two, this is correct. He does have authority over all of these things and they were delivered to him and he can give it to whomever he wills so which is true is is he lying or is this true I'm gonna show you from other places in scripture that it is true but even just from this scripture we know it's true he's talking to Jesus what does he think he's going he, <laughs> you think Jesus doesn't know who's in charge you think Jesus doesn't know what the situation is and I'm going to say this, if this is supposed to be some type of real temptation to Jesus, then it had to be true. Or else it wouldn't even be a temptation in the first place. Jesus would just say, what are you talking about? You ain't in charge of nothing. You don't have any authority. God has all the authority. You don't have anything. That's not what he said. He said, get behind me, Satan. Because <laughs> that's not the way we're going. That's not the way I'm going to do this thing. But what Satan said there was actually true, and I'm going to show you that from other places in Scripture, from three different places I'm going to show you that. But I want to read it to you again. Satan said to Jesus, To you I will give all this authority, talking about the kingdoms of the world. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And then he said, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Well, when... Was it delivered to Satan? God didn't give him this authority. Only thing in Scripture we see where God gave authority was he gave it to Adam. So then how'd Satan get it? Well, it was delivered to him by Adam. When Adam yielded to Satan, 
he yielded to sin, he didn't realize he was giving up his authority to Satan over this planet. Because the Bible teaches that whomever you obey is your master. And when he yielded to Satan instead of God, he gave up his authority to Satan. And now Satan has authority on this planet. He doesn't have complete authority, but he has a lot of authority. I'm going to show you that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul writes, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. What does he call Satan? The God of this world. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. John chapter 12, verse 31, the, these next two come straight from Jesus. John 12, 31, it says, Now is the judgment of this world, and now will the ruler of this world be cast out. So he was about to die on the cross, and he was explaining, he called Satan the ruler of this world. So up until this point, Satan had authority on this planet. Can you imagine Jesus calling Satan the ruler of this world? That's how he referred to him. John chapter 14, verse 30 Jesus says again, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded to me. And he says it again in John 16. He calls him the ruler of this world again. So Satan's words in Luke chapter 4 were true. He did have authority. Now, the cro through what Jesus did on the cross, we don't have... Uh, time to get into it this morning is probably something that we're going to get into uh, next week. But through what Jesus did on the cross, the Bible teaches that Jesus crushed Satan's authority. And so what you end up with now is a sort of a split kingdom situation. And so what you hear about for the rest of the Bible is the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And Jesus preached it all the whole time. Go read the Gospels. He preached more about the kingdom of God than he preached about anything else. And what he was trying to explain is there is a new type of kingdom that's going to be established on this planet. Satan still has authority in the kingdom of darkness. But I'm establishing a new kingdom on this planet that anybody through faith in Christ can come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And when you come into the kingdom of light... When you come into the kingdom of light, you're no longer subject to the kingdom of darkness. You come out of an arena where Satan has authority, and you come over here to the kingdom of light where God has authority, but they both exist simultaneously on this planet. And that's what you see going on in our world. When you look at our world, you see the kingdom of darkness and you see the kingdom of light. And anybody at any time can repent and come out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And when you do, you come out from under Satan's authority and you come over to God's authority. And you're no longer subject to the way, to, to the way that Satan does things and the, and the authority that he has and trying to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. No, you come out of that kingdom and you come over to God's kingdom and the kingdom of light. And for the rest of the Bible, this is what you hear about. Over and over and over again. Jesus preached it. Paul preached it over and over again about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Well, in the kingdom of darkness, for those that reject Christ... For those that reject what he did on the cross, they remain in the kingdom of darkness. There's still an offer of salvation. There's still an offer at any time they can leave. Did you know that's what the word gospel means? The word gospel is an announcement. It means an announcement. It's an announcement. It's an announcement that says you're free. It's an announcement that says it's over. Everything has changed. And so when you read in the scripture, it's confusing because people go, well, the Bible says that Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. This is that, that he conquered Satan, that, that all that's been defeated. That, that's exactly correct. And people choose, either out of ignorance or out of sin, they choose to remain in their bondage. But everybody's free. The world is free. All 8 billion people are free at any moment to walk out of the kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of light. But through deception, blindness, ignorance, whatever, they stay in. And the calling of us that are over here in the kingdom of light is to shout and bring the, the gospel, the message, and say, hey, you're free. Come out of that and come over here. It's better over here. 
come out of that and come over here. You no longer have to live in Satan's kingdom. You come out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. That's why we preach. That's why we witness. That's why we share our testimony. What are we doing? We're going around and we're, we're announcing what Christ has done on the cross. And we're saying, it's over. You don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to stay there and live there. You can come out and you can live in the kingdom of light. Now, what happens if, this is a good news, and we'll get into this more in this series. What happens if you've come over to the kingdom of light, but you still, you still feel like Satan has some authority operating in your life? Because that can happen too. But what you need to understand, and again, we don't have time to get into this morning, but what you need to understand is that he's operating illegally. He doesn't have authority in your life anymore, but that doesn't mean he won't try to take it. That doesn't mean he won't try to get you into sin and just like Adam getting you to make choices and decisions and get back into sin where he has a door now and he has access into your life. It doesn't mean that he won't try to do that. But when you understand your authority in Christ, when you understand that he doesn't have authority to be doing this in your life, and you use the name of Jesus and you take authority over those situations, guess what? He has, the Bible says that Satan has to flee. Paul wrote it to Christians. He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know why you're going to have to resist him? Because he's going to keep coming. Yeah. Just because you came over to the kingdom of light doesn't mean he's finished attacking you and, 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 and warring against your soul. He's not finished with that. But the difference is, before he had a right to be there. Before he had, a, when you were in the kingdom of darkness, he had authority over you. He was your master. Now, the tables have turned. Now, you're sitting from a position of authority as a son or daughter of God, and he has no right to be doing the things that he's doing. And so, you have authority to resist him and to get him out of your life and out of your family. And we're going to talk more about that in the weeks to come. So, God gave Adam authority but then Adam gave it to Satan and then Jesus came and he crushed that authority but for those who still reject Christ they still remain in the kingdom of darkness but anybody can come out at any time that they want Satan cannot stop anyone <laughs> that wants to leave the kingdom of darkness and come over into the kingdom of light he, has, he can't do anything about it because Jesus defeated him and made a way and a path for everyone to come out. Now next week, we're going to get into more specifics about these things, but I wanted to begin to lay a basis for your understanding of why Christmas. Okay, I, I gave you sort of a brief run through, but we're going to get into more specifics of why it had to be the way it was. Why did Jesus have to come in as a man in order to accomplish the things that we were talking about this morning? We're going to get more into that in the weeks to come, so make sure you're here and uh, don't miss it. Let's stand on our feet this morning. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we come to you this morning by the name of Jesus so grateful and thankful for the truths of Scripture that we were reading and meditating on this morning. Father, I know there are people here that have not yet transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And Father, I, I believe this morning that there are some that are going to make that transition. God, I pray over those that are in that valley of decision deciding whether they want to be a follower of Christ whether they believe whether they, they have faith to believe what we're talking about this morning God I pray over those that, that want to believe that maybe have even come over to the kingdom of light but they're still struggling with the, with the leftover things from the kingdom of the darkness Father, I pray this morning for them that we could experience complete freedom across all fronts. Freedom from bondage, freedom from sin, freedom from Satan's authority, and that we could experience true freedom that only comes from being in Christ. 
Father, we take just a moment to yield our hearts, our soul, every part of who we are to you. Lord, help us this morning. Help those that are believing and having faith in Christ for the first time this morning. Cause the miracle of the new birth to happen in their life where they're born into a different kingdom this morning. In Jesus' name. If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here and you say, I'm ready to come out, I am ready to leave the kingdom of darkness and come over into the kingdom of light. It's very simple. The Bible says all you have to do is believe what was preached to you this morning. You just have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He came to this earth to defeat Satan by dying on the cross. If that's you and you say, I'm ready, I'm ready to experience new life in Christ, then I want to pray for you this morning. Or maybe you're here and you say, well, I've, I've prayed that before, but I'm struggling. I have, I have gone back and forth between kingdoms. I'm, I've, I've backslidden. I'm, I'm not living like I should. And I need to make a fresh commitment this morning to live for God, to follow God, to put my faith in Christ. Then I want to pray for you this morning as well. If that's you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come down to the front, anything like that. I just want you to raise your hand right where you're at so I can see it. I'm going to pray for you. If that's you. Just lift your hand right where you're at. Don't be ashamed. Just lift it up so I can see it. I want to pray over you this morning. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for those that are responding, that are reaching out to you this morning in their heart. God, I pray for those that are needing salvation in their life, responding to you by faith this morning, those that are making a fresh commitment to you this morning. Father, I pray this morning for you to do the work that only you can do, the miracle of the new birth, forgiving sin, washing us clean this morning by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we receive that this morning. We thank you for that this morning. Father, I pray for those this morning that are struggling with effects from the kingdom of darkness, those that, that feel bound, those that feel trapped, those that feel like there's no way out. Father, I pray all across this room that your spirit could just move and work and operate this morning, bringing life and freedom and joy that the darkness has to leave this morning by the authority that's in the name of Jesus Christ. We know there's power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe this morning that as we call on the name of Jesus, that freedom can come. Life can come. True change can come by the power and the authority that's in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's just take a moment and do that together. Let's just all together say the name of Jesus. Say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We call on the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus. We know there's power in the name of Jesus to break curses, to break bondage. To get rid of sin, we call on the name of Jesus Christ to move and work in our church this morning. To move and work in impossible situations. Thank you that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. That at that name there is authority that every knee has to bow. Sickness has to bow. Disease has to bow. Satan has to bow. Everything has to bow at the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you're working and moving in people's lives. God, I pray this morning that you would fill your people with hope and encouragement and faith to believe that change is possible, 
to believe that freedom is possible. Help us see the light at the end of the tunnel. Help us to see the path forward out of our situation as we cling to Jesus, to the name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said amen. Praise God. Amen. Isn't God good? Listen, we're going to dismiss the service, but I want to ask the, the worship team to just remain up front for a moment. And we're going to dismiss. But if you need prayer this morning for any of the things that we were talking about, I want to invite you just to come. And Jennifer and I would love to just pray with you, agree with you about what's going on in your life. And, uh, and just believe God. To, to work and move. Amen. Let me pray over you as we leave today. Father, once again, thank you for working and moving in our church. Thank you for uh, the, the blessing us with your presence and your spirit in this place today. Lord, I pray as we leave today that your spirit would go with us, encouraging our hearts and helping us to see the revelation that's presented to us in the gospel. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you said amen. Praise God. You guys are dismissed.